here knows what the number one fear in America is. Public speaking, exactly right. You know what, you said it first, I'm gonna give you a book. <laughs> okay, public speaking, number one fear in America. By the way, number two is heights, number three is bugs, specifically cockroaches. <laughs> number four is steaks, and number five is death. Three quarters of you in this room would rather die than stand up here with me and speak. That woman raised her hand, you can have a book too. <laughs> well, why do I bring this up? Well, I'll tell you the reason. is because 25 years ago this year, I had the world's greatest job. I was the Director of Marketing and Public Relations for Florida State University. Awesomeness. And one morning, I woke up with an epiphany. I literally popped up out of bed and said, if I'm ever gonna do anything different, today's the day. Without telling my husband, I walked into the president of the university and said, I'm giving you three months notice, I'm gonna go start my own company. And he said, have you ever worked in a company? I said, no, sir. He said, have you ever worked outside of academia? I said, no, sir. He said, do you know anything about running a company? I said, no, sir. He goes, why are you doing this? I said, I have passion. <laughs> he said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> Three months later, let me tell you how effective I was. I walked out of the beautiful academic environment I had no office, no desk, no phone, no computer, no business plan, no marketing plan, $50,000 in debt for my husband going to law school and a 17-month-old baby. Passion does not pay the utility bill. <laughs> but let me tell you, within six days, I had five clients. And let me tell you this, 25 years later, we're a $20 million business. We have been named eight straight years in a row by Florida Trend as one of the best places to work in Florida. And as the number three best place in America in public relations, and even more important, five years in a row by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing businesses in the US. And what I love is that you can be a great place to work and you can be a growing business, and that combination of creating a culture that says hire the best and keep the best is what helps make things happen. So I was just telling Dr. Hartnett, after hearing awesome presentations today, over lunch, I rewrote my speech for you. <laughs> But let me tell you what my secret to success is. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Picture this. My fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Armstrong, black cat eye glasses, blue dress, white support knee high hose, tennis shoes, and the only thing I remember her saying for the entire fourth grade year was, keep your eye on your own paper. <laughs> She's right. That's what we've got to do. She's brilliant. See, what I find is that we as women are always out there trying to compare ourselves to someone. We're not as good as them. We are better than them. I'm all about data. And I do benchmarking, but as a CEO of a company, I want to spend more time on growing my company than comparing myself to somebody else's company. Do you see? What we got to do is focus on us instead of focus on them. And to do that, you become very successful. I have to laugh. I've heard Oh, I have a degree in PR. I have a degree in communications. I don't have a degree, whatever. No one 
if anyone in this room can have my degree, I'll give you a bottle of wine. <laughs> my bachelor's degree is in medieval Russian history. <laughs> Now, you can imagine what my parents said. You're majoring in what? What are you gonna do with that? But you know what I said? I loved every minute of every rushing class I took. And when I got out, I said, well, you know, there isn't a job for a medieval Russian history major, but that's okay because what I'm going to do is I'm going to find what ends up being right for me. And I want you all to feel that. Don't feel the pressure. We tell fourth graders they have to determine what they want to major in in college. It's okay. Do what brings you joy, and that will be your career. And that's what mine ended up being. Well, I have to tell you, the day I opened more communications. Now, I told you I had no office, right? So if I was going to meet with a client and I had to meet with five in order to get five new accounts, guess where I met them? There was a golden corral across the street. <laughs> Free parking. Good meatloaf. But what it dawned on me is that what I really needed was to have a mentor. And what I realized 25 years ago in Tallahassee, Florida, was there was not one other woman CEO in Leon County. Now there were women that owned businesses, Tupperware, Mary Kay, there were women that worked in state agencies and in our outstanding academic institutions, but there was not a woman I could go to and say, hey, how do you file a tax? What's my intellectual property? Give me some ideas. I had no mentor. So I decided that every person needs a mentor. I don't care if you are just starting out in your career or you are towards the end and trying to think what's your next phase in life, I think every person needs a mentor, but we women especially need mentors. So what I decided was that since I couldn't find a mentor in Tallahassee, I'd create my own virtual ones. So I have two mentors, never met them, they don't know they're my mentors, and one's not even alive. <laughs> I decided if I was going to start my own business, who should I have as a mentor? Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> I wanted to have Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey tell me what to do. My favorite Oprah Winfrey um, quote, she was being interviewed. I think it was around the time she was about to end her major television show. And they said something to her about, you know, what do you like now versus when you first started? And she goes, oh, I'm the very same person. I just buy better shoes. <laughs> but Oprah knows how to promote Oprah. And we as women have got to be looking at mentors like that, right? Now, I opened up a marketing, public relations, advertising. We didn't have web design back then or social media. Integrated advocacy firm, and I decided, well, who is the best marketing person in the world? I decided that was Walt Disney. So Walt Disney, of course, had passed away by that time, so it was me talking to the beyond. <laughs> But what I realized was that everyone knows what their products are. Everyone knows what their service is. Everyone knows what the return on investment is. Everyone knows what their mission statement is. I needed to learn from the best in marketing, and that was Walt Disney. I think that what we all have to have is a mentor. And let me tell you, I openly say to 300 plus of you in here, 
you contact me on e email, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm not so good on Snapchat. <laughs> and you want to ask me a question, I'll answer it because I want to be your mentor. Let me tell you what I tell CEOs. What women need is a mentor who can say to them, you can do it. You can do it. We birth babies for crying out loud. <laughs> what we find, though, is that women want to be told, oh, good job, outstanding. And what do we do? We work even harder, right? What we need to say is, we need to hear good job, outstanding. Now show me the money. <laughs> because we as women, until we think we are worth being paid up here, then nobody's going to do it out of the kindness of their heart, right? We've got to take control of our own destiny. So what I thought I'd do for the next few minutes is not talk about being bold, which is important, and not talk about necessarily finding a mentor. I want to give you some resource tools that you can leave this room, and if you implement even one of them, I think that helps you put yourself further down the path towards leadership. So here's the first one I want you to know. Friends don't let friends PowerPoint. <laughs> right? Death by PowerPoint. However, if you are going to do a PowerPoint, there is a rule, by the way, there was a Harvard professor, I don't know, he probably got a federal grant, who figured out the best formula for a PowerPoint. You have an opening slide and an end slide, and you have six slides in between. On your six slides, you have six bullets and no more than six words per bullet, and you don't speak more than 20 minutes. 666, easy to remember. See, I told you, PowerPoint devil. <laughs> so, if you're not going to do a PowerPoint, which some of you may have to, let me give you a few other things to think about. First of all, I have a rule. Every person in my company must be able to quote the mission statement. Who in here can quote their mission statement? Awesome. The best mission statements are 10 words or less. If you can't quote your mission statement, you can't fulfill the mission of the company. Does that make sense? I go around to, not necessarily employees because they already know it, but when I go and work with businesses, I say, what's your mission statement? And what I find is sometimes it's three paragraphs long, right? Or worse yet, you're flipping the page and it continues for three more paragraphs. A mission statement should answer one thing. Why are you doing something? What is your mission and why is that important? Why? I want you to write down the word why. W-H-Y, why? Every organization, in addition to having people know what their mission statement is, and of course vision is important and values are important, I think an elevator speech is the next most important thing. An elevator speech, it's an overused term, but I'm going to continue to use it anyways. 30 seconds. Who you are and why should I care? That's what an elevator speech is. Why is it what you do in your organization or your organization going to mean to me in my life? What is it that you do and why should I care? And this is what I tell businesses. If you do business cards, sometimes you have a blank back. That back should be your mission statement or it could be your elevator speech, or it could be something that says, here's who I am, and this is why what I do is important. 
let's make sure that we have a very good 30 second elevator speech. Does anybody here know um, where that term came from? Believe it or not, elevator speech, it took place back in the 70s, and it was how long it took a person to get from the first floor to the top floor of the World Trade Center, if you went nonstop, 30 seconds. And day traders had to talk about who they are and why they were so special in that amount of time. You need an elevator speech. You also need a 20 second infomercial. Now, I travel four to five days a week, every week of the year, and let me tell you, there are so many varieties of vacuum cleaners for sale at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm watching infomercials because that's the only thing on. By the way, I can tell you what cosmetic will take this and make it look like Christy Brinkley. <laughs> right? Well, people don't buy airtime on TV at 1 a.m. in the morning if they don't think it's a good investment. Infomercials work. You need 20 seconds, you and your organization, who you are and why are you so passionate about the good things you're doing. And if you're a business, a hospital, I want to have an infomercial, 20 seconds, by a doc and a nurse and a patient and the person who brings dinner to the, to the patients. And I want the guy that's the parking meter person. I want your board of directors, you students. I want you to think about who are influential in your life. Because when you get in that job, those are the people who you will figure out, that's the job I want because you saw an infomercial. You saw somebody talking great about your organization and how passionate they were. That's the kind of job that you want. You need an elevator speech. You need an infomercial. You need three facts. Facts, F-A-C-T, facts. Every organization needs to have three consistent facts that every employee uses. Doesn't matter if you're in the public sector or the private sector, you're a small business, a big business. What we need is consistency. Now, these facts can be interpreted to, through the lens of every individual, but we don't want somebody talking about this fact and that fact, and there's multiple inconsistencies out there. People's brains are overloaded as it is. I do a lot of media training, and I'll take a, a person perhaps running for a political office, and they'll want to tell me everything that began inside the womb on. <laughs> no, tell me three things. That's all I need to know. Just give me three things. If you want to market your business, you talk about how awesome your product and service is and why it'll make a difference in the world to your customers, and then give me three facts to back it up. That's all I need to have, and you will go exponentially in increasing revenue. You hear me saying three, 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 three? In our culture, threes are very important. You know, the Egyptians all were, pharaohs were buried in a pyramid because three perfect sides, and they believed you couldn't get to the afterlife if you weren't in a perfect vessel. But for us, threes, how many little pigs are there? Three. How many wishes are given by the fairy? Three. Okay, how many musketeers are there? Three. Please remember the number three, right? Okay, here's the last three I want you to know. Every organization needs to have three stories. Three stories. You heard Susan give three wonderful stories. Actually, she gave four, so she gets an A+. Plus. <laughs> three stories. Now, I'm going to tell you a true story to make my point. This is a true story. Several years ago, I was out in Montana with um, a group of individuals who were trying to get some dollars set aside by that legislature to put into mental health funding for people with schizophrenia. Now, I don't lobby, never want to lobby, but I do do help people with the surround sound, all the marketing and PR things that we all know. 
So we have the sponsor of this bill, and we get into his office, and we're there, and we're sitting, and we're sitting, and we're sitting, and we're looking, and he's not showing up. And finally, he runs in and says, sorry, I don't have time to talk to you. And I said, oh, sir, I, I, we really would love to speak to you. He says, well, walk with me to the meeting. Yes, sir. And it's, so I'm walking. I said, sir, let me tell you why this bill is so important. I want to tell you about Gary, why this bill means something to Gary, why this bill means something to Gary's family, why this bill means something to Gary's community. And he looked at me and he said, thank you, shut the door. He went up onto the dais, sat down. I'd never been to Montana's courtroom before, so I go and sit in the front. He gains the gavel down and he says, now we're gonna take up House Bill 122, but before we do, I wanna tell you about my best friend, Gary. <laughs> and proceeded to tell my story word for word, which by the way, I made up. <laughs> But this is what I want you to remember. If I had said, this bill is gonna cost this amount, and this is the economic impact of it, and this is the number of people, and this is the number, 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 he would have said, thank you, close the door, and that was it. What did he remember? He remembered the story. Every single business and organization has great stories to tell and we need to be telling them. And you at all times must have three ready, by the way. You should have three of them on your website. You should have three of them in your media kit. You should have three of them as framed information pieces in your office because it's about the people and the emotional connection you have. It's not about the dollars. It's about what you do for someone else. One more thing I want you to remember. Write this down. Every organization needs to do a brand assessment every 12 months. Now, whoever in here has money, please hire me. If you don't, I'm gonna tell you how to do a brand assessment. Very easy, not sophisticated, but pretty accurate. A brand is not your logo. A brand is not your sign. A brand is not your letterhead. A brand is what other people think about you, right? So here's your brand. If I say something, the first word that comes to mind is what the brand is. So if I say Walmart, you say cheap. <laughs> You know what? They're okay with that because they want to be the low-cost, high-volume carrier. Now, they might use a different word, but they don't have a problem with cheap. If I said Mercedes, you might say luxury. That's what they want. Low volume, high cost. I want you all to know that you need to do that with all your stakeholders once a year because I promise you, you will find some misalignment at some place. And somebody who is working on increasing revenue is only gonna do it because they've got a brand somebody wants to align their dollars with. So, what word do you want somebody to say when they say your name? What's the one word when they say, Karen Moore. I think what you'll find is that sometimes what you think your brand is may be a little different than what other people's brand perception of you is, and sometimes they're even better because we are hard on ourselves. I want you to do a brand assessment of yourself, your department, your organization, your business, and your community, and all your stakeholders need to participate in it and do that at least once a year. 
You know, the US Chamber of Commerce says 70% of people are hired based on first impression. Based on first impression. Do you know how long it takes to make a first impression? Three seconds. Three seconds. The University of Oklahoma did a research project on what those three seconds entail. God, I need to be paid for projects like this. Three seconds, 75% is on how you look. Are you dressed professionally? Is your hair comb? Do you look neat? Do you look like you're ready for work? 20% is on how you talk. Do you talk too fast? Do you talk too slow? Do you talk with an accent? 5% is on what you say. Stand there, look good, and be quiet. <laughs> Well, maybe not, but first impression is important. And for us as businesses or organizations, first impression is anything from the letter they receive to the front desk person, to the parking attendant, to the person who opens the door for you. Think about first impression. I want you all to know that first impression also leads to social media. I hired a headhunter recently to help me find a new VP. I thought was an outstanding candidate, and I went on her Facebook page. And you know what? She was there in a very nice, very low-cut dress, drinking a martini. And I thought, now I'd like to be with you, but I'm not going to hire you. Because what we want is we have, as women, still need to be seen as being as confident as we can be. And sometimes that confidence means we got to stop showing some of the other stuff that we do. Right? Well, let me tell you about social media. I tell clients every single day, we no longer do digital marketing. Write this down. We no longer do digital marketing. We do marketing in a digital world. This is the 21st century. Let me tell you, the flyers, brochures, annual reports, pink and blue things that we hang up all over the place, money down the drain. We've got to recognize that not only is the technology a huge asset for us, but if we're not leveraging it, I promise you our competition is. And if we're not using it to the fullest extent, then shame on us. So let me talk to you just a few minutes in our last little bit here about some social media. So the first thing I want you to know is that 60% of all products, now this has been verified by Pew, it's been verified by numerous studies, 60% of all products now are bought based on what somebody's friend said about it on Facebook. If you're going to buy that vacuum cleaner, you may be watching the infomercial along with me, but you're going to go on Facebook and ask, see what your friends are buying. 60%. Well, guess what? There's um, an interesting survey. I've only seen one, so until it's been verified by a couple different research projects, I question it, but, it's, but what was said was 70% of supervisors say that social media impacts the way they grade the performance of their employees. So what I'm saying is think about what you're posting, but more importantly, you better be posting. <coughs> because they see you as an asset and a door and a window to all their stakeholders and other stakeholders, and that's an asset they can't do without you. So whether you are on Twitter or you're on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or Pinterest or any of these platforms, what I want you to do is here's the rule of thumb. If your organization is 10 million and below, you need to be on three platforms at all times. If you're 10 million and above, you need to be on five platforms at all times. And all times means aggressively putting new content out 
and linking and sharing with each other because that's the way we do business. And for those of you that are reaching out to students who may be under the age of 21 or who are buying their first house or might be needing a nurse practitioner, let me tell you, they're researching that information on the internet. They're Googling you before they make any call. So I want you to be thinking about this. So here's the three platforms that I think are the most important for we women who are in the room. Twitter is number one. LinkedIn is number two. Facebook is number three if you're over the age of 30. If you're under the age of 30, you need to be on Snapchat. And if you are trying to reach people in those demographics, you need to be on the ones that are most appropriate there. By the way, Pinterest is the number one site for women. If you have marketing directed towards women, you need to be on that site also. Let me tell you how powerful it is. This was three years ago, Southwest Airlines. A woman, they're sitting on the tarmac, hour and a half, Southwest Airlines, can't get off, the tower won't let them to go. The flight attendant's trying to make everybody happy. She walks to the end of the plane. There's this woman crying hysterically. She says, what's the matter? The woman said, because of you, I'm missing my son's wedding. And the woman said, I'm so sorry, we can't leave, the tower won't let us go. She said, I don't care. Because of you, I'm missing my son's wedding. The flight attendant went back to the front of the plane, got on the mic. She said, ladies and gentlemen, because of the predicament we're in, there's a woman on this flight who is missing her son's wedding, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass out napkins and pencils, and I want all of you to write a good luck message to the happy couple, and we'll deliver it to them. And within 10 minutes, this angry group was all sharing, well, what did you write? Well, I gave them the name of a good divorce attorney. <laughs> what did you write? I gave them my favorite recipe. What did you write? And 30 minutes later, all of a sudden, they started collecting money. And by the time the plane left and managed to get to its destination, I'll be up five hours late. When the woman from the back of the plane got it to the front, she had been given $148 to go buy a wedding gift from the people on the flight along with a big handful of napkins. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because that night after the wedding reception, the woman went on every one of her social media platforms and said, I want to tell you the world's greatest airline is Southwest Airlines, and I will never fly another airline in my life. Let me tell you how awesome they are. And do you know what the flight attendant did? She went on her social media platforms and said, I want to tell you I work with the greatest passengers in the world. Let me tell you what they did today. And within 24 hours, Southwest Airlines had the highest number of ticket sales they had had that entire week. Now, there was no discounts given. There was no press conference. There was nothing other than people posting on social media and talking about this wonderful experience. If we're not doing that, then shame on us. We ought to be talking about we helped a young couple get their first house. We helped somebody graduate, and they're about to get the job of their dreams. We helped a mother who was in not good shape come out with her child. You know, we need to be sharing these stories and please do it on social media. So I told you I opened the business 25 years ago. Um, so I'm sitting in Golden Corral and I take out a notebook and a pad and I write down three things. Karen, this is what your company's gonna be about. First thing I wrote down was do the right thing. Just do the right thing. We live in a time and a culture where people are angry and they're frustrated and they're lying and accusing of lying. And you know what? Let's all just do the right thing. Even if it allows our competition to get a leg up. Second, I wrote, be innovative. Because let me tell you, 
in this world right now, we're com we are competing with people not in Pensacola or Florida or the US. We are competing with people in China and India and everywhere else, and they wake up every morning and say, how can I do it bigger, better, faster? And that's what we got to do too. And the third thing I wrote down was be your own champion. Be your own champion. If we can't proudly talk about the things that we do, then how do we expect anyone else to do that? We need to do the right thing. We need to be innovative and we've got to champion ourselves. And we as women have got to learn that lesson and mentor it to the next generation who will mentor it to the next generation. That's what I want you to think about. Now, I'm going to call Dr. Sherry Hartlett to come up stage here. And you know what? There is another person in this. There's another person in this room who I adore, and that's Jennifer Grobe. I think she should come on up too. Here are two incredible women that if you're looking for a mentor, they need to be on your list. <laughs> we got the memo. Jennifer didn't. You did, I know. <laughs> so, if you will hand me my phone, we're gonna do we're gonna do two things while Jennifer's coming on up. So I want everyone in here to get your phone out. Five years ago, I said that only a tenth of you would bend down and pull something <laughs> out of your purse. We now live in the smartphone age, right? So what we're going to do is we are going to take a selfie with you, and you are going to hashtag it to hashtag WILC18. Okay? Then you all are going to selfie yourself, and then you're going to take a picture of other people doing selfies, and then you're going to post it. And when you post it, this is what I want you to do. I want you to say thank you to Sherry for this event. I want you to say thank you to the president for this event. I want you to say thank you for UWF for investing in leadership and role models for the women in this community. Because if it weren't for this kind of investment, we wouldn't have the next generation of leaders. So here we go, ladies. All right, smile nicely back there. Here we go. Awesome. Okay, selfie yourselves. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. All right, cuz I know you want to get out. I'm the last thing between you and an awesome week vacation apparently. I'm going to Washington. That is not an awesome week vacation. Last thing I want you to know is you all are amazing women. This community has incredible women leaders, and you're helping the next generation become incredible women leaders. And that's what we need. Stop worrying about anything else. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Thank you.